Bueno, buenos mediodías a todos. Hoy tenemos el placer de tener en, en Ciencia Compartida al profesor Ul Ribesel de la Universidad, bueno, del Centro Geomar, de la Universidad de Kiel, en Alemania, que es un, un experto, uno de los grandes expertos a nivel internacional en la cienificación en el océano. Y como saben, ha estado llevando aquí a cabo un, un experimento del que nos hablará un poquito y nos va a hablar también de, de la cienificación. Me ha dicho que va a aprender un poquito de español la próxima vez que venga. Pero <laughs> hoy la charla, today the talk is going to be in English, and he wants to make it interactive with the students. So don't hesitate in asking any question. If you want to ask something and you want someone to translate it, we, we, we can do it. So don't worry about that. So, all time for you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice words. Oh, yeah? Since the majority of people are sitting here, I'm moving over to this side. And yes, please interrupt and feel free to use any language if English doesn't work. And then we'll see how we, we uh, get to translate this. Um, but I will come with questions to you as well. So I want to test. <laughs> so I will uh, involve you right from the start. It's about ocean acidification, which I call the other CO2 problem. The one CO2 problem most people on this planet are well aware of. It's climate change, which comes due to increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, which increases the uh, greenhouse effect, and that warms our climate. That's in the media since, I don't know, 15, 20 years, IPCC has reported about this widely. So most people on our planet have heard about it in one way or another. There is, however, another CO2 problem. And some people call it the, uh, the evil brother of the uh, global warming, um, which is ocean acidification. Um, and I'm afraid not quite as many people have heard about this, even though the implications can be quite broad and, uh, and strong as well. So to just give me an idea on where my audience is today, I have a few questions to you. And I just ask you to raise your fingers when you agree with it. So the question is, do you think, as citizens or scientists, whatever you feel uh, closer to your heart, that the ocean is acidifying. Who thinks the ocean is acidifying? OK, that's not too many yet. <laughs> so, so I have to, I mean, that's important now. Raise your hand really high. How many of you think the ocean is acidifying? <laughs> okay, that's, that's a bit more. Maybe let's say 90%. 90% of you think the ocean is acidifying. Okay. How many of you think that humans are the cause for this? Okay, good. Those that didn't think the ocean is acidifying, don't, don't raise the finger here, which makes sense. <laughs> which makes sense. Good. Uh, okay, so about the same number think that we humans are the cause for this acidification. Do you think that life in the ocean is harmed by the acidification? How many of you think that life in the ocean is harmed by this? Okay, that's slightly less. So let's say we have 90% acidifying and now it's probably like 70 or I don't know, 65 or so. So slightly less think that, that it harms organisms in the ocean. Um, now comes the critical question. You probably haven't thought about this, so I give you a minute to think about this. Do you think that this will affect your life, your personal life? Well, if you disagree on the, on the ones before, you don't have to think, then you of course disagree on this one. But if you thought that it might affect marine life, then now you should think, well, if that's the case, will it affect my own life? How many of you think that it will affect your life? Okay, that's about half. 
Good. And keep in mind, this is a scientifically educated community. So if you would ask these same questions out on the street, the numbers would probably be lower on all of these. Um, question, is there a solution to this problem? If you think there's no problem, then we don't have to talk, think about <laughs> solutions. But if you think there's a problem and if it could harm your own life, then you may wonder, what is a solution? How many of you who thought that it could affect marine life and your own life think that there is a solution to this problem? Okay, that's there, that's two, three, four, five, six, five, seven, and there, eight. So eight of you think there's a solution. In which case, I don't have to continue. I mean, that would just live with the uh, consequences of certification. If there's no solution, there's nothing we can do. And then, as a scientist, we don't even have to talk much about it because if we think there's no solution, why, why, why even bother researching it or, or communicating it to the public? So that's, that's, that's room for discussion. And then, of course, the final question when I, when I end with this, do you think you will be able to contribute to that solution? So of those eight people who raised their hand, <laughs> how many of you think that, there's a, um, that, that you personally can contribute to that solution? So that there's more people now <laughs> that chat is scientifically inconsistent, but but <laughs> great, great. So yes, I I have a question to you. Go ahead. Uh, I think the the question is uh, it has like um, like a mild answer. I mean, you can have a complete solution of the problem, or you can have a partial solution of the mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. Which, uh, defers on the response. Very good point. Yes. Um, so, so, so let's let's take the the mild solution. Do you think? I mean, the complete solution is almost impossible in the next thirty or forty years. But a mild, like like we, we may go in the direction of a solution. And, and that let's let's take that as a viewpoint. We we won't solve it immediately in the next twenty years, but we may change in that direction and I'm, I'm coming back to that okay so that's that's giving us giving all of us kind of an idea on where we stand in this group as a scientifically educated community out in the public would probably get shaking heads from most of the people so meaning we haven't made the way yet into the public with this the other CO2 problem most people accept, yes, there's climate change, but acidification, what is that and why would it affect me? That's probably the, the response you get from most people on, on this planet. What I will do now is I present you with eight facts. And I, I use this, this term facts on purpose. I mean, these are facts. This is, I mean, when there's uncertainty in the sense of IPCC reports where they have uncertainties, I, I name them uncertainty. What I will talk about is eight facts about oceanification that the oceanification research community, and this is a huge body of, uh, of scientists, have agreed upon. So these are eight facts that are consensus in the community. Fact one, the ocean absorbs one quarter of man-made CO2 every year. If you look in history, since the beginning of industrialization, it's about 50% of fossil fuel CO2 that ended up in the ocean, but from year to year, right now it's just one quarter because we've increased so rapidly in the last uh, couple of decades. Of the CO2 emitted by human activity into the atmosphere, 3.3 uh, gigatons CO2 come from changes in land use activity, deforestation, changes in agriculture, and so on. 32 something gigatons CO2 per year come from fossil fuel utilization, coal, gas, oil, and maybe in the future methane. I hope not, but who knows. Together about 35, 36 gigatons of CO2. Of those, 44% end up in the atmosphere. And we can precisely measure this. This is the increase that we see in atmospheric CO2 year after year after year. 
you can get a global map of that. In fact, there's someone in the internet that you can download now and see how it, how it changes in seasonal time and so on. So this number has a very low uncertainty, as you can see here, because we can measure it so precisely. So we know 45% of that goes into the, stays in the atmosphere. It originally goes all in the atmosphere, but 44% stays in the atmosphere. Luckily, only 44%. If it were 100%, then climate change would be much faster than it is already. 27% goes in the ocean. We don't know this quite as precisely. You see the uncertainty here. Uh, it's because the data set is just not as extensive, and measurements of uh, carbon chemistry in the ocean are uh, time consuming, so we don't have quite as many. Um, but this is calculated based on measurements that we have and based on model calculations that were performed with that. So about one quarter goes into the ocean. The remainder, which ends up being 29%, we don't quite know, which is, if you think of it, quite a remarkable uh, thing. There's, there's 100, sorry, 10 gigatons of CO2 going somewhere on our planet, and we don't really know where it's going every year. Over time, over the last 50 years, it amounts to the entire North American forest, Canada and US, or the entire North Eurasian uh, Europe and, and Asia, all the way to, to the eastern part of Russia, forest that is growing somewhere, and we don't know where it is. It's just calculated as the residual of the other two. We can precisely measure these two and this one. We just estimate and we don't know where it is. That tells us how well we understand the carbon system of our planet, or the carbon, carbon system, carbon cycle of our planet. Of course, we want to know, is this staying the same? Is it changing in the future? Because that will affect how much CO2 stays in the atmosphere. Is whatever sink this is, and there's arguments, it's the boreal forest, now it's more the tropical forest. Is this changing? Is it staying constant over time? Uh, that will affect how much stays here, and that will affect the uh, change in, uh, in climate in the future. So we don't know. That's fact number one. And just to give you the development over time, um, this is how the CO2 emissions developed since the 1990s. You can see here there's an increase. These are the emissions. I'm not talking about the concentrations. The concentrations, as you all know, we are, we've reached 400 ppm in the atmosphere. These are the emissions. We started about 2022 uh, gigatons, 1990. It increased at about 1% per year until the early 2000s. And then it increased even faster, 3% per year in the first decade of the century. And now it's slightly lower, 2.5% increase in CO2 emissions. I mean, the goal is to turn this around and let it decrease, and at the end come to, well, zero CO2 emissions when we're possible, but to low CO2 emissions. Well, we are still increasing year after year. No change in sight. By the way, this little dip here, that's the worldwide economic crisis. That uh, little pri well, that big crisis caused this little, little dip in CO2 emissions. And then the year after, it, it was right back on track. So we are far from turning the wheel around to reducing CO2 emissions. We're increasing it year after year. And there's good records on which countries, which areas of our planet contribute most. OK, that's the situation. It says gigatons of CO2. And gigaton, I'm not sure. If you can imagine what a gigaton is, how much is that? And that's what I would like to look at with you now. So, so going back 37 gigatons, that's where we're around about now, presently, emitting 37 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere. How much is that? One gigaton. Any, any feeling for this? Is this a lot? or? Well, it's 10 to the 15 grams times 37 is a gigaton. That's this number. Uh, one billion, uh, this is the American billion um, uh, tons. And I now would like you to think, okay, so this is a German coal wagon. 
Um, <coughs> it has 12.6 meters in length. It can take 65 tons of coal. If you take coal, coal has about 80% carbon. So if I have 37 gigatons of CO2, that comes to about 10 gigatons of carbon, pure carbon. The rest is the oxygen. So 10 gigatons of carbon, if I put them into these coal wagons, how many of those will I have? And if I line them all up, how long will this train be? That's the question to you. And you're free to guess. I mean, don't be shy. Just guess. <laughs> if I, this is per year. So 10 gigatons of carbon per year lined up in one long train. How long will the train be? Give me some, some indications. 1,000 kilometers, 10,000, 50,000. What, what do you think? That you have, you no, have something I in mind. I think it's 10 to the 15th, and then you've got to try to. I don't know. 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 Imagine. Yeah, yeah. Just to get a yeah. feel for the amount of CO2 we are releasing into the this is carbon now, the amount of carbon as coal we are releasing to the atmosphere here. What do you think? <coughs> from, here, from here to Madrid? <laughs> More? <laughs> from here to New York or uh, from here to I don't know. You, you mean you're <laughs> the physicist always has to get Well, it's only to divide 10 by 65 and divide by 12. Is that simple? It's a lot. Exactly. It's, very simple. <laughs> it's a lot? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I haven't had any number yet. It's, it's more than from here to Madrid. But give me a number. Fifty million meters. I mean, fifty billion. Fifty billion kilometers, meters. Fifty billion meters. Okay. Okay. Divide this by the circumference of the of the Earth. How many? It's around two hundred. Okay, twenty six thousand miles. Twenty six thousand miles. You calculated the miles, of course. You can multiply that by five to get kilometers. You've come many, many times around the world. Uh, yes, indeed, 10.1 gigatons of carbon is 150 times 10 to the 6 wagons. This is 48 times around the world, or 4.9 times to the moon, and per year. Every year. This is every year. This is the amount of carbon we emit it to the atmosphere and then becomes CO2 year after year. That's massive. So that also gives, brings us back to Javier's comment. You can't easily turn that around. I mean, that's, that's no fix, no quick uh, fix to that problem. It takes a huge effort of uh, human society. And we have to start thinking as a human society, not as countries or, or Governments, we have to think we are all inhabitants of this planet and see what we're changing. We're perturbing the system, the Earth, in a way which is unprecedented. Fact number two. Very simple. <laughs> Further CO2 emissions means continued acidification. And this is simple carbon chemistry. I mean, there's no, no need to discuss this, unlike climate change, which has a lot of uh, complicated <laughs> feedbacks. This is very simple. Any chemist will, will agree. If you add CO2 into water, and this is what happens when you increase CO2 in the atmosphere, more CO2 is taken up by the ocean, it will, oops, sorry, it will react with the water to form carbonic acid. That's simple chemistry, there's no doubt about it. The ocean presently absorbs 25 million tons of CO2 daily, that's four kilograms from each of us, on average, per day. 
So sum this up in a year, how much we put that next to your bed, and the room will fill up fairly quickly if you have that amount of CO2 um, in, your, in your bedroom. The acidity of the ocean has increased by 30% since the beginning of Industrial Revolution. That is measurable. That's not calculating, mean, we calculate that, but we can measure the last uh, couple of decades. I will show you some data later. And the last, largest proportion of that was uh, contributed in the last 40 years. So I mean, you see from the increase uh, over the past uh, two and a half decades, this is when most of this was put into the atmosphere, and <coughs> one quarter of that ended up in the ocean. This now shows you a projection. This is planet Earth in pre-industrial times. And this is where the pH was in pre-industrial times. And now I will start the animation. And we will go from the year here is now 1950 until <coughs> 2300. Forget everything beyond 2100. Uh, I think it really depends on how we as a, as a human society respond to, to this challenge. I don't think it's, it's any reasonable looking further than that. But until 2100, I think, unless we make major changes fairly quickly, it's probably a realistic scenario. It's assuming business as usual. Uh, IPCC, uh, the, the, the old uh, 92A scenario. Um, and I have to say, that's, in fact, that was, in the early days when it was still proposed, it was seen as too pessimistic. Now we know uh, it's even more optimistic than, than reality because reality has caught up and is even worse than those, those business as usual, the early business as usual scenarios. And I hope I can get this started. Okay, so you see pH is going down here. This tells you the, the average global mean pH, and then you see there's slight differences in, uh, in regional uh, terms. And now we are getting close to the end of the century, and we're at a pH of 7.7, .7, global average 7.7 .7 pH. That's the surface ocean only. You see the Arctic is acidifying faster, and so is the uh, Antarctic. We're not seeing that here. And now we are beyond anything that I think is, is realistic because we don't know what CO2 emissions will look like um, in 2300. But that is, I mean, this is really, 7.4 is really the worst case scenario. And if you think 7.4 doesn't sound like much, uh, I will show you data how consistent pH was in the ocean in the, in the past. Anything beyond 7.7 .7 has not happened. In, uh, in our oceans for a long time, at least for the last 300 million years, which is the time span that most organisms in the ocean have evolved in. So most of them have not seen the uh, development which is projected until the end of this century. So 7.7 .7 about here was in 2100. That's a projection based on business as usual CO2 emissions. This is measurements, fact number three. And you will find here its data included right from where we stand, the SDOC station, which is, it's hard to see here, the blue data, in fact, SDOC, the European Station uh, for Time Series of the Ocean, which is about 100 kilometers north of our Grand Canaria. Um, it was initially serviced quite frequently. Unfortunately, it's not, not as easy to get there anymore. Here are the time series stations which have been maintained for a long time. This is uh, HOT in the Pacific, uh, Hawaii, Bermuda, the BAT station, and this is ASDOC here. And you can see here, this is the partial pressure of CO2 going up. This is the uh, global average here. The blue line is uh, SDOC. This is uh, um, HOTS, and this is BATS. Uh, and they all basically agree with the slide offset. Basically, agree pCO2 is increasing. This is pH. pH is decreasing, consistent with uh, what you would calculate based on the pCO2 increase. And this is the carbonate concentration, carbonate ion concentration, 
which is important for many calcifying organisms because that's what they use to build their shells and skeletons, which is also decreasing. We can measure it. It's not just in our brains. It's happening out in the ocean. And the change is 0 0.11, 0 0.11 units or 1,2 units since pre-industrial times. And that corresponds to this 30% increase in acidity. If we go to 7.7 .7 by the end of the century, that corresponds to 150% increase in acidity. Remember, the pH scale is, is logarithmic. So it doesn't sound like much, but it's, of course, a huge change in acidity. Fact number four. If you look into Earth history, um, you will find very quickly that between glacial and interglacial times, that's the most recent change in atmospheric CO2 that we've gone through. This record goes back to 800,000 years. In fact, we can extend this to 2 million years, where we have pretty much the same variation in pCO2. pCO2 is varying between uh, 280, maximum 300 <coughs> and 180 at the minimum. In that range, we see these pH changes here about 0.1 pH unit between glacial and interglacial times. That's exactly the amount we have added on top now. 0.1 unit, slightly more. Uh, so we have basically gone out of this and into this range here, which is already on global average. I mean, locally, we have much higher excursions. But on global average, this is basically outside the natural range, just outside. And of course, that will change dramatically as CO2 increases here, projected until the end of the century at about 900. And then the pH will go down to this level here, which is, as you can see here, far out what we've had in the ocean, the surface ocean, in the past 2 million years. And in fact, it's faster. And this is the important message to all biologists. It's faster, definitely. The, the change in, in uh, pCO2 and level the change in pH faster than it has happened in the last 55 million years. And there's a recent publication saying even going back 300 million years. And the speed is important because the ocean has a very good buffering system. If you give it enough time, then carbonate chemistry will make sure that the pH doesn't change very much because there's a lot of calcium carbonate in the, the sea floor which dissolves if the ocean acidifies and buffers pH changes. So given enough time, the ocean will buffer huge excursions of pCO2 in the atmosphere, which we've seen, for example, in the Cretaceous, where CO2 was much higher than today, but pH was still close to levels we have today because of the buffering capacity of the ocean. The problem now is the excursion in pCO2 goes so fast within 100 years or 200 years that the buffer capacity of the ocean has no time to respond. It takes about one overturning of the ocean, a thousand years or so, for the deep sea sediments to respond and release some of that alkalinity to buffer the pH change. So it's really the speed of the excursion, the perturbation of CO2, that <coughs> makes the pH go beyond those ranges that we've seen in Earth history. That's why organisms will probably not have learned in their evolutionary history how to deal with this, because they never experienced this before. It just goes too fast. The total excursion is not being unknown for planet Earth, as we know from previous time, but the speed is unknown. That may make all the difference, 10 times faster than the natural processes. Fact number five. This is, again, a projection, but uh, you can uh, take data in those areas and you will see what is said here. Polar seas will be corrosive with respect to calcium carbonate. This is for aragonite, shown here, within the coming decades. It goes until 2100, and then it starts from, from the beginning. Just look at it, where it goes faster. So any value below 1 is considered corrosive. Corrosive meaning calcium carbonate dissolves under those conditions. You see here that the Arctic presently still is supersaturated, so calcium carbonate remains stable. But within 30 years or so, or 20 years from now, it will become 
um, corrosive calcium carbonate over large areas. The Arctic is affected first, Antarctica comes slightly later, which is due to differences in, in carbon chemistry in those waters. Uh, we know why the difference is, but uh, uh, I won't go into the details. But you see, this is what's going to happen. And this is almost unavoidable unless we change CO2 emission, emissions dramatically. And it means that if you're calcified in these waters, life will not get easier in the future, depending on how you build your calcium carbonate and depending on how you protect it with organic layers or not, you may or may not be able to deal with this. But at least you have to deal with waters which are corrosive for calcium carbonate. So the investment you have to make into building your skeletons and shells and you name it, uh, will be higher. And then your competitive fitness, of course, will go down because you have to compete with others who do not calcify. Okay, that's fact number five. <coughs> fact number six, lots of studies <coughs> have been done and most of them on single organisms. And this is just uh, kind of a very nice compilation by Hans Otto Pörtner and uh, a student of his, published in 2013. And it shows for different uh, uh, taxonomic groups how they're affected by CO2, corals, echinoderms, uh, mollusks, cr crustaceans, and fishes. And you see here, red meaning negative effects. They seem to show up in a large number of species, so this is 40% of the species, only five tested here, 13 tested here, and 18 tested there. So about 40% of the species show negative effects at this CO2 level, at this, or at this. And you look through these different groups and you say, okay, about half of the species are affected um, at CO2 levels beyond 500. Not for the crustaceans, they can handle much higher CO2, as you see here. Uh, surprisingly, also the fishes uh, seem to be, but there's a relatively low number of studies, fishes seem to be affected at, uh, at this CO2 level. It's all done on organisms isolated from the natural environment. Um, bringing them into the lab and then exposing them to high CO2, and you always wonder, well, how representative is, is this? And they're usually done short term, these experiments, couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of months at the most, and you wonder, well, these organisms have a chance at least to acclimate, but maybe even to adapt, and that takes longer time, so do we collect the right data? I mean, is this a good indication of what's going to happen in the future? The answer is we don't know. So it's too early to say. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a high probability, and that's fair to say, that ecosystem function because some will be able to deal with this, others will have a high energetic cost to deal with certification, <coughs> so they will probably lose their competitive fitness and drop out of the system. So lower biodiversity, <coughs> I think, is a highly probable scenario for the future ocean and changing ecosystems. We don't know in what direction. Most likely less calcium fibers. Fact number seven. Um, of course, we'd like to know how ecosystems respond, and there's not too many studies on that. One nice example that people have used in recent years are those CO2 venting sites. There's a couple of locations on our planet where CO2 is coming out of the sediments because of volcanic activity. And one is shown here, this is work by Catalina Fabricius, as of Papua New Guinea here, where almost pure CO2, and the, the critical thing is, is this really pure CO2? Because if there's any other gas coming out, then of course that gas could have the impact. So you have to make sure it's really pure CO2. So far they thought that it is, but then recently they found that there was uh, some other gas coming along with it, and now they're not sure anymore. Um, if it is, then it's a very nice indication on how ecosystems may respond. This is the uh, surrounding area, uh, very rich and biodiverse uh, uh, coral reef community. If you get closer to the venting site at this pH, this is how it looks like. There's still some corals, but less biodiversity. But the ones that remain seem to grow okay. And then if you get really close to the venting site where you see the CO2 bubbling out here, that's when you have a very low biodiversity. Most of the corals are gone in the those conditions. 
this may be a good indication of the potential for adaptation because these CO2 outgassing venting sites exist for um, hundreds, if not thousands of years. So maybe if adaptation is not happening here, maybe it tells us it's difficult. It's certainly difficult for corals because of their long generation times. Not so much for microorganisms, which divide once per day or so, and have huge population sizes. Their adaptation may, may be possible. My final fact, and now I come back, is it, will it affect you? Is how human populations, human societies, could possibly be affected by acidification. One obvious uh, criterion is, uh, well, we all know fish is the primary protein source for a huge number of people on this planet, particularly in developing countries. We all know that. Um, we also know that coral reefs provide habitat for millions of species. They provide coastal protections, protection revenues for tourism, biodiversity heritage for the future. If we lose coral reefs, we lose all that. If we have less fish harvest, of course that will affect human societies to a great deal. We don't know the answer yet, but the potential at least is there. There's very few examples where we can already show today that there is an effect. And the one example that is most often cited in, uh, in the news and sometimes in, uh, in scientific presentations is the, the oyster farming at the U U US West Coast, which has broken down consecutively in six years until they finally realized, with the help of uh, Dick Feely, who <laughs> gave them some pH sensors, that it's because they were pumping CO2-rich waters into their oyster farms when they tried to hatch their, their, their new oysters. And the oysters would never hatch until they realized, oh, it's because the pH is too low. And the pH was so low, not so much. I mean, Dick Fury likes to say because of acidification due to human activity, but it's mostly because these waters are acidic to start with, because it's upwelled water, it's uh, low in pH to start with, and if you're a smart oyster farmer, you take your water when there's no upwelling, then you have no problem. This is what we learned. So, so this is taken as the one example where an acidifying ocean is affecting. Uh, in this case, oyster production. And the oyster production actually went down in this area, and, and they put numbers like 100, 100 something million dollars that were, that were lost in, in revenues because of this. Aside from that, there's not too many examples yet where human consumption or human, uh, what, where ecosystem services of the ocean are directly affected and affecting human, human uh, activity. But that may change. Okay, um, those are the eight facts. I'd just like to say a few words about where I think ocean acidification research stands today, and then I will end with uh, what has brought us here and what we've done over the last uh, 11 weeks here on Grand Canaria. Um, acidification research has seen a remarkable surge over the, uh, the past decade or two, and this is the number of papers on ocean notification since 1900, and you see here in 2003 or 2004 really picked up. This is the number of authors that has pu have pu published uh, uh, in this area. And the increase since uh, 2000 is 35% increase in uh, research in published with peer review uh, published papers, 35% uh, per year over this uh, last decade and a half. If you compare this with uh, science in total, that was, uh, that's an increase of 4.8% uh, per year. So clearly this stands out as one of the fastest growing areas in science and certainly one of the fastest growing areas in marine science. So lots of work went into it. If you look at it, oh, and 50% in the last 3.5 years. Yeah. So it's really a new, new field. If you look at it, where most of the work has been done, and this is now where I see the biggest challenge in our field of ocean education research. So this is the number of drivers. Driver means stressor. 
the IPCC now likes to use driver because not every stressor has to be negative. Some may be positive, <coughs> so driver is more neutral. Single, double, multiple. This is the space on which research has been done. Single species, communities, ecosystems. And then this is the time axis here, so it's kind of three-dimensional. I hope it's, it's visible. Most of the work has been done, well, hopefully, on acclimated organisms. Some has been done on stressed. They were still not acclimated. They were under immediate acute CO2 stress, so then, they, then, then they're even here. If the work was done well, then they, at least they are acclimated, physiologically acclimated. But they had certainly no time to adapt, genetically adapt, because we hardly do experiments on that time scale. So most is done on single species um, with a single driver acidification in short-term experiments, lab experiments. That's where 80 <coughs> to 90% of the work is. Um, of course, we know that there's other drivers changing at the same time, warming, deoxygenation, changes in nutrients, um, changes in stratification, which changes the light climate. So many other are changing, and we're just starting to accommodate this in our, in our research. So we're just going to multiple drivers. Double, you see quite often now. Um, triple gets already quite tricky in terms of setting up a, a useful experiment for that. We're also slowly moving up from the species to the community and ecosystem level. There's few examples still, but this is the direction we have to go. And there's very few studies now looking at adaptation. Can organisms on long time scales adapt? And all the work that has been done, of course, is on, on short-lived organisms. Cognitive force is where most of the people started with because of their short generation times and large population sizes. What we want to know, of course, eventually, is not down here, is up here. We want to know how ecosystems respond, adapted, and to multiple drivers. Once we know that, then we can estimate what the ecosystem service changes will be in terms of fish harvest, production of shellfish, um, protection from coral reefs, and so on. And then we can give advice to policymakers and say, okay, this is what you have to keep in mind when you make decisions on this and that. It costs this many dollars or euros to not act on this. And keep that in mind when you make a decision on do we need more oil pumping or coal power plants or whatever. We're not there yet. That's why we can't be hurt, really. And policymakers can ignore us for the time being because we're still here. So we can't give good numbers for this. And that's why it's still the little brother of the CO2 uh, problems that we have. We can't put numbers to it as well as uh, global warming can. There's a challenge here. If we're here right now and we want to be here in our research, we have to do three things. One, once we have to, to go to multiple driver experiments, we have to go to ecosystem, community ecosystem level experiments, and we have to go to long-term experiments. If you try to put them all together, you will quickly find you can't do all three in the same experiment. In fact, the approaches are very different. An experimental biologist working on this, this scale here, on this axis, will use very different approaches in addressing his or her problem than somebody who is working with ecosystems or communities. You cannot easily do experimental work and combining the three axes. That's why it was very interesting on a recent Quarton Research Conference where it was, this was the topic, and you could nicely see in the presentations, excellent presentations, but they would all go on one of these axes and almost nobody was able to combine them. And this is the big challenge I see in our field. This is where we will be moving into. We will go on different branches, and it will become more and more difficult to pull it all together and eventually get this, this answer here. So that's why our community has really needs, needs to act, to act very carefully, to think really where we need to put funding 
how do we how do we combine these these different axes? Okay, that's going to come out uh, December 18th in Nature Climate Change online if you'd like to to read it paper. To accommodate one of these branches, this one here, going from species to ecosystems, what we built uh, in Kiel is this, what we call Cosmos system, the Kiel Offshore Meter Cosmos for Future Ocean Simulations. This is how they look like on land, a bit uh, awkward. Uh, this is just the floating frames, and if you've been out to Tagliata, well, if you come out now, you can still see them, at least uh, a couple of them out there. We built initially nine. Now we have uh, ten. One was left at home. Here in, in the uh, backyard of, of the Geomar. And this is when they are loaded on the ship. In this case it's the Greenpeace ship Esperanza. Mm -hmm. This is when they are deployed. You can see this is not Grand Canaria. <laughs> and this is when they're out <laughs> in, a, in a study. And this was in fact Spitsberg and Svalbard in the high Arctic. That was our first study. Um, up here, and of course, seeing fact number five, you, you can see why we went there, because the high Arctic is the one that is affected first in terms of uh, carbon saturation state, so we wanted to study that particular part of the ocean. From there we went to um, Hawaii for a short intermezzo, because uh, Dave Carl wanted to, to see if we can use these mesocosms of the Hawaiian island free-floating and it nicely worked, but uh, only three mesocosms, so not a good uh, um, study to do solid tests. Then we went to Bergen 2011, to in the Baltic Sea 2012, Christine back in Sweden 2013. This was, was particularly long term, this was a five month experiment um, starting in the freezing cold of, uh, of Sweden. And now here. And, uh, we just finished this experiment last week. It was great fun. Uh, was that you smiling, right? Was, was it fun? It was hard work as well. It was really hard work. Um, I showed you the protocol uh, a couple of slides down. Very hard work, but it was successful. So we got eight of our nine mesocosms through the entire experiment. Um, we always tend to lose one or two. So always some things go wrong, and also did this time, well, many things went wrong, but some things could be uh, solved. Others, well, this number, this one mesocosm could not be uh, saved. These are the plans for the next couple of years. We will return to Bergen in 2015 because we have some really remaining crazy ideas. Kind of uh, the raisins from the cake, as I say. Uh, some raisins are left behind, and we want to study that in an area where we feel comfortable and we have uh, good knowledge of the system. So we're going back to Bergen in 2015. And from there, we go to the Peru upwelling system in uh, 2016, which will be even a larger challenge, I think, than, uh, than Gran Canaria for us. And uh, I'm not sure what experiences we will make, but it will definitely be a huge, a huge challenge to, to work there, both scientifically and logistically, I think. Okay, this is from here. This is our Cosmos Grand Canaria 2014 experiment. The Espanides helped us deploying the mesocosms uh, in Gando Bay, which is just uh, off the airport. Uh, excellent site for us because it's well protected, it's very clean not too much uh, ship traffic uh, in fact nobody's allowed but some people do go through it <laughs> This is uh, we got permission from the military, it's also a nature preserve so lots of permission work and Plokan was, was great help for us to, to get this all set up um, this is CO2 addition, this is the regular sampling we were lucky to have our, our director, the director of GMR come out with us and sample on one day, and this is a beautiful scenery. Andrea took that slide. Um, and these are the two projects that fund, projects that funded it, and the collaborations. Um, excellent help from Plokan, and wonderful collaborations with uh, people here at the University of Finance. This is the uh, experimental design, so we had nine mesocosms going in PCO2 from Control. This is present-day surface ocean PCO2 <coughs> up to 2000, um, and this is for kind of a regression type 
analysis. Uh, as I said, we lost one. Unfortunately, my favorite piece of cosmos number six was lost um, halfway through the experiment. So we ended up with A at the end of the study. And this is now the protocol, just to give you an idea on what's being done. And Nozette will still feel every step in his, uh, in his bones, probably. And, and I know Andrea does, too. This is when we started. Mesocosm deployment was on September 23. We call it T minus 8 because it was eight days before the first CO2 addition. They were closed on T minus 5. And the first sampling started on one of the T minus days before we added any CO2 to ensure that we have like the basic picture before manipulating the system. Salt addition to determine the, uh, uh, the volume of each mesocosm back. And then the CO2 addition started here in four steps to get to those target values. We had to redo it twice during the experiment because we lost CO2 due to outgassing. To compensate for that, we added more CO2 at two steps. This is the period when we had every second day sampling, which was already quite demanding, uh, but feasible. Then we added deep water to see, well, what would happen to these waters if south of the Canary Islands, they get upwelled waters in these eddies that you uh, um, very consistently have in the south of, uh, of the Canaries. Deep water was added 20% or 23 point something percent to each mesocosm, the same precisely the same amount of deep water was collected at 650 meters offshore. And then we shifted to daily sampling, which was even tiring. And then finally, when the bloom was over, the bloom happened and lots of uh, responses at all levels, we shifted back to every second day sampling until day 5 on November 27th. This is when mesocosm 6 was lost. This is when we added uh, fish egg larvae, or egg, yeah, eggs, which were meant to develop into larvae and then grow after the deep water addition when there was enough food. Unfortunately, they did not survive. This is when the plankton nets were taken. This is when mesocosms were cleaned. So there was lots of activities throughout the experiment. At the end, we had uh, some final sediment sampling and uh, cleaning of the sediment traps to make sure that everything that was falling down was already ending, ending up in our mesocosm sediment traps so we have a complete budget of the system in terms of carbon and the nutrients uh, that were in it. That's the schedule kind of. And this is the processes that we look at. Uh, everything in this uh, red, uh, was it square? No, not a square. Rectangle um, is what we covered uh, in the music cosm. So different uh, reservoirs and different processes were measured either directly through uh, measuring rates or indirectly through change, uh, measuring changes in the different reservoirs. Different components of the plankton community, they were all precisely determined in terms of composition, in terms of numbers, and in terms of their rates. So the entire, basically, pelagic system was covered with uh, 46 people in total on site. So it's a huge enterprise. Lots of people put in a lot of hard work into this. And we have a wonderful data set, unprecedented for the oligotrophic uh, ocean. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what we learn from this. I won't say what we believe we've learned because it takes a lot more analysis at home to really put the story together. This is the team. At the beginning, they are still happy and smiling, of course. Um, they still smile now, um, but they're a bit more tired. If you want to read about the uh, experiences during this campaign, there's, there's an ocean blog. So, so the participants of, of this uh, study have written their little stories. Uh, on what they experienced. It's sometimes very personal, so it's nice to see what it's like being part of a study like this. And uh, now I come back <laughs> to my questions. I skipped the first two ones because most of you have <laughs> um, Yes. Um, there was Yes. There was less people thinking that life could uh, be affected. Can I check again? How many of you 
<laughs> still think that, well, how many of you think that life is affected by certification? And I'm particularly interested in those that may have changed their mind. So, so just raise your hand again. How many of you think that life could be affected by a certification? Okay, let me check. Who thinks life is not affected by certification of the ocean? <laughs> you think it's not affected? Good. Let's talk afterwards. <laughs> I don't mind. Any Anybody else who thinks life is not affected by ocean certification? Life in the ocean. Okay. I, I'm sure that yeah. it would be affected by... Um, you know, this... This uh, uh, figure about uh, uh, acidification until two, uh, 2,300, you know, the, the, uh, um, the petrol is going to finish uh, during, you know, during this... Uh we have lots of coal and there's still methane, methane hydrates. If, if we are crazy enough, I hope we're not. I mean, I hope we, we are smart yeah, species. The methane is, a, is another problem, of course. That there's yeah, many, many countries working on, on getting their hands on the methane and using that as, uh, as a replacement for natural gas. Many countries, including, I have to say, including our institute. <laughs> um, so, so if we want to con continue using fossil fuel, coal is, is good for another 500 years, as we know, at current, at current uh, rates. Methane, the estimates are hugely deviating, depending on uh, who you talk to, but there's at least as much as there's oil. Probably five times more than that, methane. If we want to take that, we can continue way beyond 2,300. So it's, it's really this up to the us. the worst scenario. Yeah. yeah, but it's my point is it's up to us to make the difference. It's not the industry or <coughs> the consumer who will be fast <laughs> to make a change. I mean, if you pay a little bit more, you can easily retrieve those, those sources. And we have to make the decision we don't want this anymore. Otherwise, we can continue. It, uh, uh, I, I think a, a point to make, though, is that to, to consider the Gaian point of view, the life, the individual species, communities, ecosystems, will change. I mean, I'm convinced of the change. Yeah. But there will still be life. Oh, yeah. I mean, it'll be like the, the event uh, two billion years ago when oxygen came, came into the planet. I mean, the, the total shift in the ecosystem at that time. But life kept on. And so, I mean, I'm just saying that, that I, I originally, when I first started, I thought, life, we'll, we'll still have life. But the diversity will be reduced tremendously. Okay. And the let richness me, will be. Let me give you an example. So, that 55 million years ago, we had this event, which may be the closest in comparison to what we're going into, where we had probably huge amounts of methane being released into the atmosphere because of some warming. And th this we know from, from carbon-14, because it's, it has a very different signal in carbon-14 than, than other carbon sources. The amount probably was in part to what we're expecting in the next 100 years or so. And the excursion was on a much slower pace. Um, so it took about probably 10,000 years to release the amount of CO2, the, the amount of methane, which was then oxidized into CO2, which then acidified the ocean after being oxidized. If you look at that event, 80% of the species were lost. You can see it in the sedimentary record. I mean, um, uh, Psycho shows these, these, these sediments where you see all of a sudden there's, there's no white anymore because all the calcifiers in the ocean were just gone. It lasted for about 10 million years, and then it came back. And then the calcifiers were back. Well, that's the 10 million years that we may go into. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to make things look, look, look bad. But you're right. I mean, life will continue. It will look a lot different. It will recover, but not in our lifetime. Yeah. And, and we won't like I mean, our children won't certainly won't like it. I mean, it'll be a, well, the it's diversification, a diversification, the diversity of the planet will just go way down. Yes. So it'll be a much poorer place to live. It's a, it's a decision that our societies have to take. I mean, do we want to accept this or not? Do we, do we, are we willing to, to take sacrifices to go a different path? Or are we just uh, 
not considering this important now. It's up to us. Jared Diamond wrote a book called Collapse, and he would, uh, the message of that book is that there are a lot of people that profit by the disaster, and these people will inhibit the whole, the, our, our, well, they, well, they will retard our, cha our um, actions to, to ameliorate the system. And this is, this is the real sad thing about this. There are people that, that like this kind of disaster. This, this is a good, I, I come to the end in a minute, but just because you, you, you mentioned this, there's a good example that a colleague of mine, Ken Caldera, uh, often, well, a couple of times mentioned or, or came up in this talk. He said, uh, think of the Gulf War. Um, the Gulf War was fought <coughs> for oil. And they pretended it was done for a different reason, but it was, was fought for oil. And the cost that the Gulf War uh, meant to the U US uh, um, government would have, if that amount of money would have used to invest into renewable energies, the US would be completely independent of foreign oil. Yeah. Yeah. But there was nobody I mean, interested in yeah. doing that. The war was much, much more profitable yeah. than, than the change in the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Because the reason was not only for oil, it was also for selling weapons. Yeah. 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 Exactly. There's always other other interest groups, of course. So that ch making the changes is extremely difficult yeah. because there's so many interest groups who profit from disaster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because I would like to ask you about the, the video. You know, when we have been flying just uh, two layers in after 2011 from uh, Ireland to Barbados and from uh, South Africa to Brazil. And we have observed that the ocean at one kilometer becomes uh, warmer and salty. Yes. What is about the response of the ocean to an increase of the pH or reduction of the pH in the condition? Yes. Have you evaluated the, the mechanism of yes. the ocean to answer to this? And it's, that's, I think, pretty much included in the global models because it's, it's ocean overturning and I mean, exchange across across uh, the, the density boundaries and CO2 uptake by the ocean. So you can, you can do this, the models show this. And eventually, if we give the ocean enough time, about 10,000 years, the ocean will take up 85 to 90 percent of man-made CO2. So the ocean is taking care of our problem in the next 10,000 years. The difficult part is what happens in between. Because in between, that CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere, has all those implications in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of certification, surface ocean certification. Eventually, it will go into the deep ocean. And the time steps, when you see the, the man made CO2 in the Atlantic Ocean, and you can see these, these, these nice maps. It goes down from, from the high Arctic, or where deep water formation takes place, into about close to the, uh, to the equator. It hasn't quite reached the equator yet. That's where most of the anthropogenic CO2 in the ocean is. The other oceans don't exchange as much because they don't have deep water formation there. Southern Ocean, to some extent, that's where a lot of the CO2 release and the North Atlantic. Those are where CO2 is taken up by the ocean. I think the mechanisms are fairly well understood. Javier. I have two questions for you. <laughs> the first one is, uh, from your point of view, what is uh, short term, the major impact of ocean acidification in the ocean? The second? The second deals with uh, how we can approach to understand the two axes that you talk about, the ecosystem and the multiple stressors. Yeah. If the modelers, they are not able to model <coughs> that. Yeah. Always try to simplify all the problems. Yeah. Okay, the, the first one, what time scale are you interested in? 100 years or? Oh, 100 years, for instance. Okay. A hundred years, I think, we can be quite certain to see major changes in marine communities. Because many of the organisms with generation times on the order of months to years will not be able to adapt. So for those organisms, I would project that many of the studies we have done on single organisms will be, can be extrapolated to the ocean, to the real, to, to nature. In terms of the, the microorganisms, I'm not sure because 
they will, most of them will be able to adapt to a certain degree. So there may not be as strong changes as we see in many of the experiments at that trophic level. At higher trophic levels, yes, I think the, the results can be extrapolated to some extent. That still doesn't answer what, what uh, interaction is there at the ecosystem level. I mean, small changes at the uh, lower trophic levels may have large implications on high trophic levels. So that's almost impossible to, to project. But in terms of 100 years from now, I think ecosystems, if we continue CO2 emissions, will look different. Less council fires, would, would less fire diverse. Would exist for our reefs? Um, my personal view, I mean, if you talk to Hochul of Birkbach, he will tell you they're gone, and many others will, will tell you the same thing. I think they will still be there, but with just very few species. Some species seem to be able to deal with it. These, these uh, porites, these really massive uh, things, not the ones with the many branches, but the, the more massive ones, they seem to be able to deal with it. Um, so ecosystems or coral ecosystems will probably be much less biodiverse, but they will not be completely gone. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how fast the, the sensitive ones can be replaced by the others. It may, there may be a lifetime of a couple of hundred years or so. But this is, I mean, I'm just guessing now. And don't take this out and, and say, well, is a predictive fact. I have no idea. I mean, I'm just, this is my, <coughs> my gut feeling. The second question? Two axes. Yeah, two axes. Um, it's a tough one. I mean, read, read the article when it comes out. We, Trump and I give some, some recommendations. It takes, it takes a community effort. And, and we talked about this. That's why I think we need to get an expert group together we need to do something as we did at the beginning of ossification research where we had the guide for best practices. We need a guide for best practices for joining these axes, make recommendations, how should our community approach this? That was funded by the EU. It needs to be supported by, by strong international agencies because we need the backing of that. And then this should be handed out if we find consensus in a large group of the community. It, it can only be consensus driven. I mean, there's no single scientist who can, couldn't do this job. Once we have that, then we should provide that to funding agencies and say, okay, this is what a large part of our community thinks should be the way forward. And this is where we think the funding should go. I don't have the answer yet. I have some ideas and I'd like to contribute to, to discussion. But eventually, I think it's a process that takes a couple of years until we, I mean, we just start realizing there is a challenge. We may run into a problem here if we just continue our science as we're doing. Start finding solutions out of that. And I mean, the, the IMBER uh, process is, is one that, that we could have used for reasons that we discussed. I, we, we didn't think that would, would be appropriate, but something like that needs to be done to find the Good. Okay. My, my worry is in the in outline. What, what is the effect in, in outline? Mm -hmm. uh, my doubt is, or my question is, there are uh, mm, many data about the effect in the agriculture of standard of history. Because, okay, in the certification of the ocean is clear with the data in, in the seawater. But, but in the agriculture, of, for example, or fishery, <coughs> there are enough data in order to, to say there is a certification in the ocean. This is my question. Currently, there are many data about this aspect in this field. In the agriculture, of this field. Really, I mean that's that's why I think we're lost when when we asked from managers for advice how they should uh, from ecosystem managers or I don't know from stakeholders in the fisheries or the yeah, yeah, we don't. I mean, you can always say don't take water when it's too acidic, and in some areas it may work, but in others you only have basically the average water available. So if you, if you need to deal with that then. What, what other advice can you take? What you can say, put some calcium carbonate in it, make it, make it uh, increase the alkalinity. Um, I think there's very little data on this. I mean, we as scientists have focused way too much on the individual organisms, and we have not 
looked enough into what really matters to society. We have to spend more of our energy in, in looking for that other thing. Um, the second question is um, how you chose the different area in order to study a civic case, for example. Uh, why in Canaria or why Callao in Peru? Okay. Good good question. Yeah. If I if I may go back to that, you will quickly see that there was uh, okay, here. <coughs> if you look at this, 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 what you see is they're all coastal to start with, but they are also eutrophic waters. So we have a nice data set now. And if you look at other groups that have done mesocosm studies, with very, very few exceptions, they have done in has been done in eutrophic waters. So we know well not enough, but we have some idea on ecosystem responses, pelagic ecosystem responses in this case to acidification in eutrophic waters. Well, 40% of the ocean is not eutrophic, it's oligotrophic. No data set from that on this application. So we looked around, where can we go and do our work and learn something about oligotrophic waters to address the largest proportion of the ocean. And initially, I have to admit, we were planning to go to the Cape Verde. And uh, we started the planning and everything and quickly realized that there was just getting very hazardous. Well, she didn't yet, but uh, she would have if we would have gone to Cape Verde because it was just logistically so demanding, difficult. And then we looked around, well, who else is there? <laughs> That's how we ended up. And we didn't know of, of all the excellent work that has already been done here and the good colleagues we would meet and the good friendships we would uh, conduct with. So it was, it was simply looking for a good place with good logistics, good support to do something in order to Peru has a different question in mind, in fact. There it's the deoxygenation in addition to acidification. So as you know, the ocean is, the, is, is losing oxygen. Most the effects will, will be seen more strongly in areas where oxygen is already low, which is in the eastern boundary upwelling systems. The one which has the lowest oxygen and the highest productivity and so on is of course the true upwelling system. So because of that, and because it's economically so important. 30% of fish harvest, world fish harvests, are taken from these eastern boundary upwelling systems. So let's study one of them, the one that's, of course, one of the best studied and the one that immediately pops to your eyes when you say uh, eastern boundary upwelling systems, high productivity, it's a good system with the lowest oxygen. And how, how are you going to combine the, the impact Oxygen minimum zone with the mass ecosystem? Yeah. Is, uh, that's, 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 a, yeah that's a long story and a difficult, <laughs> difficult task. We're actually not too interested in the oxygen itself. We're interested mm -hmm. in the effects that the oxygen has on nutrient cycling and, and the ecosystem at large. And the effects are seen more strongest in the nutrients because low oxygen. Uh, it makes you lose nitrogen from the system due to deantification and anamox. And low oxygen also makes you gain additional phosphorus because anoxic sediments lose their phosphorus because they're not bound to, to iron anymore and then they come out. So you have very unusual nitrogen to phosphorus ratios. And this is what I think will affect the ecosystem most strongest. In some areas of Peru, you can get up to NTP ratios of one. 16 is red fuel, that's what the entire ocean has. Five is quite common there, NTP five, and in some areas down to one. What does it mean if the ocean has lost massive amount of nitrogen, gained a little bit of phosphorus? What does it mean in terms of productivity? And if this continues and spreads, what will it mean in the future? Is the excess phos phosphate, is that generating nitrogen fixation in the area? We don't measure much. If you look at nitrogen fixation rate measurements, they're high in the Atlantic, they're very low in the, in the Pacific. Where's this excess phosphate going? That's so, so lots of questions related to changes in the nutrient cycling, not the direct effect of, of, uh, of oxygen. So, well, it's interesting, but we can't manipulate mm -hmm. it. The exchange is much too fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Well, I've tired you down. Thank you 
so much for your attention. Um, it's nice that I had a chance to <coughs> show this to you. And I'd like to end with uh, this <laughs> picture. I, I forget about the question. This picture, and uh, I would like to acknowledge the wonderful collaboration we had here with these partners. Uh, lots of support, and as I said, good friendship. And we really hope we can come back someday with some other scientific questions, of course. Thanks for coming, and uh, good luck with your work.